Good morning from the land down under, brothers and sisters. Um, I had to be able to come on here to follow up. I let me tell you, I I have been uh, disappointed and uh, a, a little discouraged myself as to. Uh, you know, as to Jesus not opening up the sky yet. <clears throat> but I was actually praying. And I, look, I am doing all I possibly can to be able to be an encourager and an encouragement to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And um, and I, sometimes I get stuck. I don't have all of the answers, <clears throat> but I do have this. I know that one of the things that happens is that when, when we're praying for something and it is so important to us, and we know that it's also important to God or in his will, we know that he hears us and we know that he will answer us, right? Oh my goodness, Texas Sweet Pea, you popped up on my screen at exactly 726. Amen, Harpazo. And that's really, I wanna focus on this. We're still there, we're still there. Okay, so hold on, hold on. I know so many people, including myself, was looking at this Passover and uh, uh, specifically uh, the uh, resurrection day as being the time that we are, uh, that, that's going to be it. So this is the, the, the highest rated watch time that I think that we have ever encountered. That's what I want to address because we are looking so much at a particular day. Now, let me tell you first off, before I get into this, and I am wanting to say, Abba, I thank you so much. You are so faithful. You are so kind. You are so loving. And you have a plan for everything. Lord, I know that when it's, it's oftentimes that it's us and our lack of complete understanding. You have a complete understanding, but we only know in part. And we know that when we see you, we will be like you. But right now, we only know in part, and you are giving us a little peace in every single moment. And I am thanking you for your peace and for your wisdom. And, and, and I thank you that we still are there, that we are still going to look at Jesus calling us up at any moment. Let this word be an encouragement and let it be filled with your understanding, Holy Spirit. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Look, here, here is what I wanna be able to say first. I, I'm, I'm human just like everyone else. I have never claimed to be a prophet. I do, I, I believe that one of the gifts that I have is dreams and God gives me dreams and some of them are really premonitions and you can't really call them dreams and they have come true and I expect that these will also come true because it's in line with the word of God but I will tell you uh, just just the same that I I was I was disappointed. I was disappointed. I had put so much into this 
And, um, but you can see, I was putting so much into it. In other words, what I was doing is without realizing it, I was trying to put God in a box. And, and I have said this before, and I'm going to synopsize this again in saying that the rapture of the bride does not have to happen on a feast day. I want that to be clear because that is one of the things that that uh, Abba made very clear to me and what he wants me to tell you, okay? And we're going to cover this in depth. But I want to tell you first off, I, 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 I was praying, I was praying, I was praying, I was praying and calling, calling out to Abba, calling out saying, Jesus, Jesus, where are you? Where are you? I, th this can't keep going on. We know that you are not teasing us. We know that, that you're showing us just how close you are to coming. So I'm not understanding. I know that you are wanting me to tell our brothers and sisters. I know that you're wanting to do that and that what you're showing us is true. But help me out, because I'm I'm thinking like you. The only way that we know anything is if you reveal it to us. And right now, I am very discouraged, not because of anything else other than I thought I understood. And uh, and so this is one of the things. So I prayed and prayed and prayed, and I'm thinking. Okay, what is this? And I'm not wanting to be disrespectful. I'm not wanting to be, but I'm I'm being honest. That's what I'm saying. You, you, you can't be dishonest with God anyway, right? And so I'm saying it it's it's hurting me. It's hurting me. I, and I don't want to be hurting our brothers and sisters. I'm I'm telling them what you want me to tell them. And I'm just, I'm just saying, reveal it to us now and what this really means. Okay. All right. So then what happens is I go to sleep. I have some more dreams. And let me tell you, I'm not going to cover the dreams but the dreams were rapture, okay? It, it's again rapture. And then I, what, I'm caused to wake up early this morning and then to, to get online. I, I'm, I'm just thinking like, what, what are you trying to show me? What are you trying to reveal to me, Abba? What is this? And uh, I'm not thinking anything about it. I'm not, I'm not prompted to be able to look at the clock or anything yet because my mind is still so focused on what is up with this? You know, here's the time in Israel is going ticking away. Here is the evening. Here's the first watch. Here is, uh, here is midnight and all of this. And I'm going like, Where's that trumpet? <laughs> oh, you know, come on. I know you've got it because I've you've actually awakened me with that trumpet blast. You actually then also awakened me out of sleep. Now, this is actually physical sleep. I don't think that I am actually asleep like we're talking about from the biblical sense, you know, but, and we'll talk about that more. But when just yesterday, when he awoke me, he said, wake up and bang. I mean, it was loud and firm. And I immediately sat up in bed, woke up just like this and immediately looked at the clock. And what is the time on the clock, right? 627 or 726, harpazo again. So that's 
It's Jesus trying to make the point. So there's something else there, right? Okay. So anyway, I'm awakened in this particular instance, not in the same way as the night before. But I'm prompted to be able to go online to that there's something that I'm supposed to see. And what do I see? I see a message from our dear sister, Rebecca Roberts Smith. And, and she, if, if, you, if you don't know her, please look up her site. That is her channel name, Rebecca Roberts Smith. And, and, and she's a wonderful sister in the Lord. And just at the time I saw her, she had just posted this message. And I'm going to read you what this message is. Uh, because I, it, it really touched me, brothers and sisters, and I need you to hear this because it's going to relate to uh, what we're going to talk about further on, okay? So she writes a message to my family. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice and ultimate plan to save us and bring us back to the Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your grace and loving us so much. You paid the payment for us children, the highest price when I first came back to the Lord in 2020, after he woke me up massively from my spiritual slumber. And I was crying and praying, apologizing to him for not being able to be good enough. I kept messing up, even trying my hardest was still not as good as I wanted to be, even my thoughts daily convicted me. So I was pouring out my heart to the Lord in sorrow. Can't we all, can't we all relate to this? I know I can. I wanted so badly to do my best, to be perfect as he wanted me to be. He interrupted my thoughts and tears with beautiful, comforting words. I wished I had written down exactly what I heard because it was beautiful and brought me to sobbing, but immediate peace and relief only he can give us. I felt like a child who was struggling in school to make all 100s or A's, super anxious and spending hours studying and still bringing on B's and not perfect grades, even though I was doing all I could. The Lord Jesus interrupted my tears as a comforting parent telling me, I have forgiven you. I have forgiven you for sins you have not even committed yet. I broke down. It hit me so hard. I didn't quite understand at the time but do more so now. I'm still learning. You see, that thought was something completely contrary to my own mind, so I know it was him. He is so good. He loves us so much we can never fully comprehend it. If you're anything like me, you are so tired and weary and barely hanging on. Jesus knows that because his Holy Spirit is literally within us. He feels it all. He's our comforter and brings us the only strength and peace we can muster in these late hours here. He promises to never leave us or forsake us. Everyone else may, but he won't. We can be completely abandoned thrown into a lion's den or a fiery furnace, but guess who's with us? He tells us not to worry or fear. He is with us. And I'm still trying to live by that daily just to get through another day. Hang on, brothers and sisters. Our Redeemer lives, and the world is about to know it. Amen. That hit me 
so hard in that moment. And I knew that's what I was supposed to see. That's what I was supposed to hear. And I immediately responded to her with a comment of my own. And I wrote, I thank you for this word, dear sister. Even the encouragers, I would like to think this is what I am, need a word of encouragement in this very late hour. Come, Lord Jesus. And that's the truth. You know, that's that's really what it is. I'm, I'm sitting there just like you, brothers and sisters. I'm, and, and maybe because there, there's a greater responsibility that I have to carry because as a teacher of God's word and, and, and doing this, it is so important to me that I do exactly what Abba is having me do, that I'm delivering what the what Holy Spirit is prompting me to deliver, that I am giving the message true as the message was relayed to me so that I can do it to you with none of me there and that it's following, it's leading you to him. That's what it's all about. When this day, this, and I'm just like, yeah, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Now, let me tell you, I'm still so excited. I want you brothers and sisters to know, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's because we may be slightly understanding. Bear with me. I want to tell you a few things. I want to tell you what he followed me up with. This morning when I got up, after I had some more rapture dreams, and I'm just sitting here going like, what? What gives? What gives? You know, when when are we going to have, when is it going to happen? It, it, like I said, I know he's not going, ah, rapture's coming. Do you think it's here? Ah, you know, it, it's actually going to be a few years down the road. But I want you to think that it's going to happen immediately, that it's so close. No, brothers and sisters, he's not doing that at all. He's not a strixer, trickster. He's not a con man. He's, he's not anything like that. He's our loving father. And he wants us to know what his will is. And according, according to Amos 3, verse 7, it says that he will reveal that he won't do anything that he hasn't revealed to his servants, the prophets. And we, as we get to know him, he reveals those things in his words to his children, to those closest to the, him, to those in relationship with him. And we're going to cover that deeper. Now, don't think for a minute that he's going to reveal it to those that are not in relationship with him, that he's just going to go, oh, I'm going to tell this person. Well, he might, but there's a purpose in it. In general, he reveals these secrets to those who seek him, to those who want to know him in a deeper way. Do you understand? All right. And we're going to cover that more in detail. It, it's a big point that I'm going to cover today. So this morning, I, um, excuse me, after I had posted, after I had posted this message, um, That's when I looked at the clock. When I responded to our dear sister, Rebecca Robert Smith. And then I broke down, brothers and sisters. Because do you know, you know what I saw?
four, five, eight. God is king. He's the one that's in control, brothers and sisters. And he's the one that's completely in control. And, uh, and I just want to, uh, when he sung that to me, when Jesus sung that to me, and that's what I was hearing again in the, the dreams I was having last night. Again, Jesus singing to me, I'm on my way. I'm on my way. He's coming, brothers and sisters. He is coming. And the funny thing, uh, uh, I, uh, now I want to correct something. Okay, so let me do this. This the the time that I was looking at this this you see this one is 854. I'm actually showing you two different ones. So let me clarify this so you don't think this is this is a when I looked at the time uh when this had come up, it was 458, 458 a.m. for me. Okay. And uh, I didn't feel it necessary to go ahead and start printing all of these things out. So you want to get the point. Well, the interesting thing was, is that this morning after I got up and uh, I was ready and everything else, then I wanted, I, I had gotten a message on my phone and it had... It had popped up that Rebecca had hearted my comment. And when I looked at the time of the hearted comment, that was this time, 8.54 or four, five, eight, the second time. Do you understand what I'm saying? Again, God is king. And, and I was actually singing again those, uh, those from what he's singing to me. I'm on my way. It's so catchy, by the way, you know, so I do this all the time. And, um, and so I, I'm, I was just thinking I'm on my way and I'm like, oh, it, you, you've had a hearted comment from Rebecca. So I look, you know, as I see what what was this hearted comment, it was the comment I had made. And I look at my time on my clock and I'm just stunned again. You know, when Abba is trying to make a point, he can make a big point. I want you to understand that. Sister Sue, it's so good, good to see you here. So, uh, so let's get back to, so I'm thinking, you know, what's going on? What's going on? What are you trying to tell me? Why do we not at this point see Jesus opening up the sky and calling us up? And, and I had then seen uh, I was brought, it was brought to my memory, uh, uh, the channel Crystal Love for Jesus. And many of you are uh, subscribed to her channel. And if you're not, I encourage you to do that. She is putting out so many uh, of other people's. She's bringing all these together, the uh, rapture dreams and uh, tribulation dreams for those that are left behind and and that sort of thing. Well, one of these actually had just come up in my mind in remembrance as to, uh, and this was a recent one, uh, and it was in relation to this. After I thought, I could, no, no, Jesus, where, where are you? And, um, 
And that dream that was in this particular one was a woman where she was saying that she had this dream. And in this dream, she was saying, Jesus, where are you? And Jesus shows up, of course, in her dream. And she says, Jesus, you're late. And so, uh, and uh, according to her in the dream, Jesus answers her, what makes you think I'm late? And then asks her, what time did you think I was supposed to be here? And she replies, you were supposed to be here at midnight. And then in the dream, Jesus tells her, well, look at your clock. And it says 1215. And, uh, and so, and that's what I, I'm wanting to say at this point. There are a lot of people that uh, like to use this idea or use this scripture, which I think is being used in an improper way. And it is the scripture out of Matthew chapter 24, verse 44, that says, For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. And they're using it. So hold on for just a second. Now, so what we are getting here, for me for just a moment. Ah, thank you, Abba. All right. For in such an hour as you think not. And I think they really, some of them, not everyone, but some of them really go way overboard with this, saying that, well, wait a minute. If any day that you think of, if you're thinking of that day, Jesus is not going to come on that day because the scripture says in an hour that you think not, that's when he's coming. So if you're thinking of this particular day, he can't come on that day. And I'm thinking like, really? Is that what Jesus is saying? Is that, or is that what you understand Jesus to think? think? No. And we're going to cover this. Uh, many of the times what we have, uh, and, and I'm going to cover this for in such an hour as you think not, but there is something to this. And that's what I'm going to, uh, kind of, um, uh, focus my attention on today. And that is the rapture of the bride of Christ as I've mentioned before, and I had to be reminded by Abba again, does not have to happen on a feast day. Now, we were getting all excited when we see, when we look at this and, and we see, first we have to understand there are three harvests. Now, there, there are uh, many that still that, that still fight against that, but I think I have covered this so well up to this point, and and there are others that are beginning to see it. It's 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 expanding because they're reading the word and they're seeing what it says in there, right? And uh, but I do believe that the second and third harvest will likely happen on a feast day. Why am I saying this? Why would the bride of Christ, now I'm not saying that it, it couldn't, obviously we were looking at this and we we're thinking like, that looks pretty good, right? Um, but not have to happen on this feast day. And why is this? Why am I saying this? Well, one particular reason is what each group is focusing on. The Bride of Christ group is focusing on Jesus. The next two groups are focusing on signs, okay? And we that that is 
all in it, you know, we could go on into stories all by itself, and I'm not wanting to take up a whole lot of time. I say that and I end up taking up a whole lot of time. But anyway, the the point is the bride loves Jesus, and the bride is always looking to Jesus. The bride is longing for Jesus. The bride is in constant relationship and closeness with Jesus. We always want him to come. Any moment we want him to come. And I think that's why we look at that. Now, what's going to happen after that? After the rapture of the bride takes place and the church and the rest of the unbelieving world is left behind, then there is going to be a difference. They're not going to be looking at that now. They're going to be looking at when is the next one going to be, right? They are going to be looking at these. And I believe that really that's the fact that those will then happen on feast days because there's a timing and the people are going to be looking at the timing, okay? So the mid-tribulation harvest, the mid-tribulation rapture is going to happen, I believe, on the feast day because we've got all of these other signs and things that they can go by going, yep, yep, yep because they won't be looking for Jesus to be just uh, showing up in the air anymore, okay? It's going to be different, okay? So, and then at the end, right, the, the post-tribulation group are the ones that will be a part of the final harvest there at the end. They are going to be overtaken as a thief. All right. Now, if you will follow me, then you will understand, I think, a little bit more about where I'm going with this. All right. Let's go into this a little bit more about for such an hour as you think not. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to read out of Matthew chapter 24, and I'm going to read verses 37 through 44, okay? And, uh, and we're gonna, I wanna highlight just a couple of things. There's so much that we can cover there. And, and many of the watchmen and watchwomen have covered these in, in, in various different ones, but I'm gonna highlight a particular point here, right? So follow me. Matthew 24, starting in verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two shall be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding it at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Verse 43. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be you also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. All right, now let's highlight a couple of things. This is the, the book of Matthew, and I uh, uh, believe that in essence that the book of Matthew is delivered to an audience of the unbelieving Jewish uh, 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 people that are, that's what this is for, and that unbelieving uh, Jewish audience 
This is what's going to happen with them. They are going to be part of the post-tribulation uh, group, okay? And there's plenty of reasons why I say that, just if you will allow me to just let's focus on that. If you make that assumption, let's go along with that assumption. All right. So what we notice out of this is the coming of the son of man. Okay. Now the title, the son of man, that's covered. We could cover that in depth, but I think that that is, you will find that that is a term that the Jews were supposed to be that was supposed to be a big you know bing flag for them to recognize we're talking about their messiah so they haven't believed that he has come yet up at this point uh in uh, uh matthew 24 we're already past the tribulation of those days uh and it's talking about these are in, in as in the days of noah and uh, so, and the flood came and took them, those are all the ones that are eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, took them all away. Where were they taken all the way to? That was judgment, right? 1111, I'm, I'm going to focus on that again. 1111, that actually is a signpost, I believe, about the judgment as in the days of Noah. Now, what I want to drop down to verse 42, where it says, Watch therefore, for you know not our, your Lord doth come. Now, that's, that's very interesting. So, of course, they're telling them to watch, but they're telling them also, you don't know what hour your Lord is coming. Okay. I like this next verse though, but know this. If the good man of the house had known in what watch, so in other words, if you had known, you don't know, but if you had known what uh, watch the thief would come, and we're going to talk about this. Why is he talking about a thief coming? Because the thief comes for those that are living in darkness and, uh, and so, in other words, the implication here is where we go on, the thief would come, he would have watched, right? So, in other words, the implication is, if you watch, it will not come upon you as a thief. I mean, you, you, you understand that, right? Okay. So, you therefore be ready. Now, this is interesting. Notice this contrast. In verse 43, it says or excuse me, verse 42, it says to watch. But in verse 44, it says to be ready. Now, notice those two things. They're not the same thing, okay? Be ready for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. That harkens back to what's going to happen next in uh, Matthew 25, where he's uh, gives the parable of the 10 bridesmaids, okay? And what is it a parable about? In essence, about being ready, right? So that's where this goes from here. But let's talk about this. Watch, therefore. Doesn't that harken back to Luke uh, 21, 36, where it says, watch and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all of these things that are coming on the earth and to stand before the Son of Man. Okay, there we are, the Son of Man, once again, okay? So let's continue on. I want to discuss a little bit more about this uh, being ready at such an hour as you think not, okay? So my contention is that that such an hour that they think not are those unbelievers that are living in the darkness of that age right then. So in contrast, I want to read about the day of the Lord out of 1 Thessalonians 
chapter five. Excuse me. And I want to read out of First Thessalonians chapter five, verses one through eleven. Now I'm I'm going to read this out of the uh, English Standard Version for ease. Okay, you don't don't want to you know get into the the whole. KJV issue. I use the KJV just like anything else. This is just for ease of understanding of this particular principle. So let's let's follow this. 1 Thessalonians 5, starting at verse 1. Now concerning the times and seasons, brother, this is of the day of the Lord, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you already know yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. We go like, wait a minute. Okay, but don't stop there. Let's keep going. While people, not them, he's talking about other people, right? While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, the ones that are claiming peace and security, as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Whoa, there's that word again, escape. Luke 21, 36, pray, watch and pray always. You may be accounted worthy to escape, right? So we look at Luke, and this is another little aside, just as Matthew was written to the unbelieving Jewish audience, Luke is written to the bride, the bride of Christ, okay? The Gentile bride of Christ. And so that's where we that's where we see this, right? Okay, so see the contrast there. Uh, and they will not escape, but the implication then is the bride will escape, okay? And uh, so for any of those that just want to say, well, you're just an escapist, you betcha, okay? I'm a Jesus lover first, and I'm an escaping the, this world uh, second because that is what Jesus has for his bride, okay? All right, verse four. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you as a thief. Now, let me read that again, okay? You are not in darkness. Who are we talking about? This is the church at Thessalonica, right? It's the, the church, members of the church here. They are not in dark, darkness. So that will surprise others as a thief, but not them. Do you see what I'm saying? Verse five, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Now, let me point out that, that there's uh, some people that try to uh, say that every time you see the word asleep and awake, that it has to do with being dead or being alive. Well, that is a euphemism that is used in scripture a lot for that but you need to be able to look at the context. And here in this particular context, we can see that it's used in both instances in this passage, but where we're talking about right now, it's not. It's talking about spiritual slumber. So let's go on and, and we can uh, say that, just point it out from the scripture. Let's read that again, verse five. For you are all children of light, children of the day, we are not of the night nor of darkness. So let then not, a, a, let me try that again, folks. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake 
or asleep, we might live with him. Now, in that particular instance, that awake or asleep is talking about death, okay, or aliveness, right? Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. All right, so that that is one of the things that we want to point out. So why is this not going to happen? This is a contrast between two groups, at least two groups. But for uh, illustration purposes, that's, that's what we want to look at. There's the children of the light. That's the church that we're talking about here. And, uh, and uh, on them, this day is not going to come like a thief. Why not? Because the bride is going to be raptured before that. And it's, uh, and they're not, uh, the bride is not asleep. The bride is not slumbering. The bride is not in the night, right? So the, the, the light of illumination and everything is on the bride. So, and the bride is removed. And so it uh, will then not come on the bride as a thief. The thief only comes after that, right? All right. And it's going to come for everybody else. I hope that that makes, uh, that makes a little more sense, right? All right. Now, I want to uh, uh, kind of change this. So for a, such an hour as we think not, what is my point there? Can it happen in such an hour as we think not? Well, here is my point with this. The bride is looking to Jesus. And what I was being shown out of this is that Wayne, what makes you think that I have to come on Resurrection Day? I have to say it's a it's a beautiful. I, I thought, wow, the symbolism and everything else is just amazing. But there is a lot of amazing rapture symbols and types and shadows that we see. But that does not mean that that has to happen that way. And so what the Lord was showing me is just like that dream, are we not saying to ourselves, if we're saying, well, wait a minute, Jesus, where are you? You're late, just like in that woman's dream. Are you following me? Am I saying that? And I have to, I have to say, that's what I was saying. Jesus, where are you? You're supposed to be here now. No, 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 no. That's not what the bride does. The bride looks and expects him at any moment. This is the season, and many of you say this is the season. We know this is, in fact, the season. And I think that he's telling uh, his bride that he is coming, he is here, but the rest of the world are, is, is seeking after the signs. Now, we look at the signs. They, they kind of, um, what is the word I'm looking for? They confirm for us that, you know, here we are. It's about to happen. All of these other things are confirming signs. But these other things are, are saying to me that what if he comes in the days after that, what if, as this is supposed to be a sign, that does not mean that the rapture of the bride happens at the very moment the sign takes place, that it happens just after the sign. In other words, the sign is to wake everyone up, right? That's what we're trying to do. But the sign is it's is not the bell that says, okay, everyone goes out. Now, so think about this in these kind of terms. The bride wants to be ready, awake, and watching. And but we so we look at the signs, and that's where we look at our clock and we see, yep, it's about to take place. But we don't lock Jesus or Abba into a box where we say, nope, you can only come on Resurrection Day. 
And if you don't come on resurrection day, there's got to be a problem there. Really? No, no, not at all. Now, does that mean that we are going into this no man knows the day or the hour type of thing? No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. I believe just like it says, and as I pointed out in Amos 3, uh, 7, he shows those he's in relationship with and deep relationship. And what does that mean when we get into our word? That's deep relationship. Let me tell you what is not relationship. All right, I'm going to go out and I'm going to evangelize the world and get everyone to come to Jesus. I'm not actually going to come to Jesus myself, but I'm going to get out there and work. I'm not going to actually have conversations with him I'm not actually going to spend time with him because I've got too much work to do, right? Is that a relationship? No, that's employment. That's, you know, I, I, that doesn't mean that I'm in a relationship with my employer. Um, you are in a relationship with your spouse, I would hope, if you have one, or friends and that type of thing, okay? Now, there are, I'm seeing those uh, what would promote the Jews to jealousy? May 14th. I am going to cover this. And this is what I want to say, brother. And I'm going to get into this next about promoting the Jews to jealousy. Does it mean that if we are raptured on a feast day, that that's going to make the Jews jealous? My answer to you is an emphatic no. No that there that is a no and that's why it doesn't matter for the bride why that's going to be the case remember that in basically in mass that the the jewish uh the jews are not believing in the first place so when when the bride is actually raptured what if it happened on a feast day do you think for a minute that that's going to mean that they're suddenly going to say all right they were right well, we know that's not the case, that they're not going to actually uh, have the believing remnant that's going to occur until the end of the, uh, the great tribulation, right? That's when that happens. So uh, I think that what it all comes down to, as I'm saying now, is relationship. The Jews should be jealous of the Gentiles' relationship with God. That's going to pro uh, provoke them to jealousy, not a feast day rapture of the bride. Now, follow me for a minute. I'm going to get into this, and that's, that's I think, a pretty good segue into what uh, I'm saying now. And I have got this uh, article that comes from One for Israel Ministry. Now, uh, I, I'm, I'm all about that because that, that ministry is, is preaching Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua, in Israel. And, and there's a lot uh, that's going on there. So that's really good. Uh, but I, I'm going to read from this because I think that it covers it very well and will help us to understand what is the provoking of Jews to jealousy. All right, so let's let's look at this. I'm, I'm going to read you from this, and then we're going to uh, have some discussion about it, okay? So it says, right from the get-go, God knew full well that his people would go astray. But he had a plan to win them back. He was going to make them jealous. Paul asks in Romans 11.11, 11, ooh, bing, 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 that should catch it. Romans 11.11, 11, did they, the people of Israel, stumble in order that they might fall? By no means, rather through their trespass, Salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make 
Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, first off, there's an insert here. Yes, it was God's plan that his new covenant would extend the possibility of relationship with God to all the peoples of the earth, and that this would also cause the Jewish people to see what they were missing out on. Think about that. Relationship. Let's focus on the relationship with God. And that's what it's all about, right? Relationship. There is a difference between jealousy and envy, and I think this is a big point. But we use the words here in English as if they mean the same thing. One, however, is sinful, and the other describes God. Envy is coveting, wanting something that doesn't belong to us. Instead of being thankful for what they have, people ignore the wise adage that, quote, Comparison is the thief of joy, unquote, and envy eats them up. But sometimes jealousy, which is to do with someone else having the right, what rightly belongs to us, can result in boundless joy. Let me explain what I mean. When giving the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, God warns that he is a jealous God who does not tolerate rivals. Israel's devotion was supposed to be for him, not anyone or anything else. He wants a committed love relationship with us and is not prepared to share our affections with any other. He will not tolerate what might be called an open relationship in today's terms. He is strictly monogamous. God has given everything for us and to us. And our hearts should belong to him. Envy is the wrong response when we are tempted to want something that rightfully belongs to another. It is about discontent and greed. But jealousy is the right response when someone who is rightly yours is intimate with another. It is primarily about relationship. And here's another time in scripture where jealousy is the right response with great results. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 21, God says, they, the people of Israel, have made me jealous with what is no God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are no people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. As Jewish believers, many of us found ourselves jealous over the relationship our Christian friends had with God and of their knowledge of our own Hebrew scriptures which led to wanting to know God like that for themselves. This is the right of all God's children, Jew and Gentile, but only through the blood of Messiah to remove the blockage of sin that stands in the way. Sometimes unbelieving Jewish people can only look on and long for such a relationship, wondering how is it that these Gentiles have such a special connection with their God, because he is precisely that, our God. But now the good news has gone out from Zion to the ends of the earth. Today, our God is the God of all nations, so there is a twang of jealousy. Wait a minute, isn't he the God of Israel? These psalms are of the Jewish King David to his God. They are Jewish. Song of Songs, love that, is a love story between God and Israel, isn't it? What is this? How are these Gentiles able to enjoy such closeness and love with our God? How come they have it 
and I don't. And this is from the Jewish uh, standpoint. Some people think that Jewish people will be consumed by fits of jealousy by Gentiles who follow the rules of the Torah extremely well. But biblical jealousy has never been about towing the line and following rules. Understand that those who want to get you into legalism. No, it is a deeply relational phenomenon. It is driven only by love and the knowledge that your beloved is intimately enjoying another. It is seeing the living relationship of the father that Gentiles enjoy. The peace in his love, the rich connection and two-way communication that Yeshua, our Jesus, has bought for us all that provokes the jealousy. Are you getting this? Seeing Gentiles with a close connection of the God of Israel. This is the jealousy that provokes many Jewish people into finding out more about Yeshua, the one through whom this connection is possible. This is the jealousy that has led many Jewish people back into the arms of their father, God. This is the jealousy that results in boundless joy. And in turn, as Jewish people are won back to their God, unimaginable riches for the whole world. And I say amen to that. Now, I would go a step farther because the, the whole point of where this is coming from, let me say again, provoking the Jews to jealousy is seeing the Gentiles in a loving relationship with their God. Do you see? So in other words, wait a minute, wait a minute. They are not seeing that. What is going to be so interesting is not the rapture of the bride, but understanding that the bride had the closest relationship with Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, that all of those then after they're left behind and the 144,000, the two witnesses and all of those that are filled with a double portion of Holy Spirit after this occurs, that is then going to start to expand. It's going to start to ex, uh, expand and fill those unbelieving Jews with wonder and jealousy. Wait a minute. All of the people of the world are developing this relationship with our Father God. And then they are going to be provoked to jealousy because of that. Let's not get sidetracked and assume that this jealousy is going to occur because they see the bride of Christ go. Because one, think about this. They're probably going to think it was aliens. They're probably going to buy into the thing because if they were provoked to jealousy from that point, then suddenly that meant that they were believing and that's not going to be the case. We know that's not going to be the case, right? But let me just go in and, and cover a little bit more about this because it's the relationship with Jesus that I want to highlight. And one of the things that I point out here uh, out of uh, uh, Romans 11 is that uh, the we're, we're not... We're missing out on the fact in Romans 9 and 10 how we're talking so much about Jesus. And that's, uh, you know, what we want to see again. OK, now in Romans chapter 11, what does that mean? We want to look at this. This passage concludes a significant section of Paul's letter contained in Romans 9 through 11. So this is a kind of a one complete topic, if you will, okay? These three chapters ask and answer the question, what about Israel? This is an objection Paul's opponents often ask. If Israel is God's chosen people and they have rejected faith in Christ as the way of salvation, what will happen to them? 
Now, Paul has acknowledged that Israel has, for the most part, rejected faith in Christ, right? He begins this chapter by asking if it means that God has rejected Israel, and his response is an astounding no. After all, Paul himself is an Israelite who came to faith in Christ and has been saved, showing that this is possible for all of the Jewish people. Paul refers to the smaller subset of Jewish people who have turned to Christ as a remnant, comparing them to a remnant of those in Israel who had not bowed to Baal in Elijah's day. By his grace, Romans 9, verses 6 through 8, God has set aside this remnant of Jewish Christians as true Israel, Romans 11, verses 1 through 5. Paul also makes a clear point about any attempt to mix salvation by grace with salvation based on works. In short, they are totally incompatible. Amen? If something is truly by grace, it cannot in any way be based on works and vice versa. And that's out of Romans 11 verse 6. What about the rest of Israel, though? What of those who refuse to believe in Christ as the Messiah? Paul's startling revelation is that God has hardened their hearts in their initial unbelief. He has caused them to trip over the stumbling block of Jesus, but not permanently. Their hardening is only done for a time, and we see that in Romans 11, verses 7 through 10. Now, one reason for Israel's unbelief is to make room on the main body, referred to as the root, of God's tree. This open space is intended for the non-Jews of the world, these Gentiles, who are coming to God through faith in Christ are like the branches of a wild olive tree that have been grafted onto the trunk of a cultivated plant. The old branches, unbelieving Jews, have been broken off for a time to make this possible. Paul warns that Gentile Christians, he warns them not to be arrogant towards the unbelieving Jews, however. The time is coming after the right amount of Gentiles have believed in Christ, when God will remove the hardening from the unbelieving Jews. They will turn to faith in Christ as a people, be grafted back onto God's symbolic olive tree from which they had previously been pruned. God is not done with Israel. We know that for a fact, right? In spiritual terms, the Israelites may be enemies of the gospel of faith in Jesus Christ for now, and that's one of the reasons why I'm also saying that's why seeing the rapture of the bride take place is not going to be able to provoke the Jews to jealousy, because first off, they're still hardened. They're going to be going through the full time of Jacob's trouble and so that's not going to be, that's not the reason for it, and that's not going to be the trigger point that's going to cause that to take place. They have to be able to see the relationship of people of the world with God. And I really believe that that's going to happen when the 144,000 Jewish evangelists, the two witnesses, start evangelizing them, uh, evangelizing the world, right? And, uh, and, and we see that taking place. I think then where that's really going to start to happen, right? And then ultimately the hardening the, the, uh, of their hearts and the scales on their eyes are going to be removed. That's going to provoke them to jealousy that's when they're going to want to see that. And then ultimately, that's when they are going to call out to Jesus, recognizing him as the Messiah that they had pierced. And that's when they are going to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were certainly spiritual enemies of Paul during his lifetime, and yet the Jewish people of Israel remain deeply loved by God because of the promises he made to the patriarchs. 
God never breaks his promises. His gift and his calling on Israel can't be taken back. God will use his grace and mercy toward the Gentile Christians to make Israel jealous. He will use these events to bring her back to himself as a nation in the form of those individual Jews who eventually trust in Christ at some future time. And we get that from Romans 11, verses 25 through 32. Now, Paul concludes this section with what has become a beloved poem, like a hymn about the vast unknowableness and independence of our merciful God in Romans 11, 33 through 36. And I, I hope that I've made that point there. God has a plan and a purpose. And many times what we have to understand is that it doesn't have to align with what we think it is or how we think it should occur. Because, uh, and, and I think that what is happening now more and more is we're beginning to realize and see more of how this plan is going to be executed, uh, and uh, and and how that you know how that is going to take place. Now, Sister Sue says perhaps as they see the Christians who are being persecuted and martyred, yet full of joy, they'll become jealous of their relationship with Jesus. And I believe you, uh, Sister Sue. Uh, but that is definitely going to be one of the precipitating factors. And why is that going to be the case? Because you are only going to be willing to die for someone that you are truly in love with, that you are willing to lay down your life with, someone that you believe in them so much that you are not going to say that you do not know them and you're willing to go to the grave to defend that. Yes, I believe that that will certainly be one of those factors. They believe in Jesus. They believe in the God of Israel, and they are going to hold on that to the death. And yes, you got to believe, wait a minute, wait a minute. How can they do that? But think about this too. There's so much, so much of the word that's going to get out there. There's so much of the knowledge of the word of the God of Israel, right? And, and that's what they're going to see that all of these people and their connection with Jesus and their love for Jesus, that's going to do what I believe is that very thing that's going to provoke them to jealousy. And the greatest time of this is going to be during that 70th week, during the time of Jacob's trouble, or shall I say the 70th week of Daniel for some of those that just want to try to parse and break up that last week of years. So uh, this is what I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to uh, end this on this particular note. I want to summarize this now. Is Jesus coming for us? Yes. Is it coming now? Yes. Is he coming when we thought he would? No. And I think that that is, there's several reasons for this. He is truly seeing who is going to fall away. Who's going to say, well, shit, I'm tired of looking out for all of this coming and everything else. Everybody just Oh, no, I, this is too much. Can't take it anymore. No, don't do that. Jesus is coming for his bride, and it's so soon. What if it was to happen today over yesterday, and you are one of those people who is going to say, I just gave up. Yeah, no, I'm just not doing it anymore. Well, then that would be, I think, failing the test. That would be what I think is losing your crown because he is coming. Don't get locked in for the bride of Christ that he has to come on the feast day, okay? Are they types and shadows? And we see this. Yes, absolutely. Is it possible 
that that is actually when the, uh, a second harvest or a third harvest will take place. We know that, or we believe that one of them will take place, you know, on the Feast of Trumpets. That's going to be the, uh, I believe the last one, Jesus comes back on Yom Kippur. I think that that's going to be what, what we have there. So, but my point is, we are learning so much about our heavenly bridegroom. And we see in all of these instances, things that are pointing to now. And we see that just because we, we know that, that Jesus, he arose. We know that that's the case. And he became the first fruits of those who rose from the dead. We know that he took some first fruits a small uh, sampling of those with him, right? We know that that's supposed to give it, and I find it very interesting. Here is one of the things that I just want to leave you with. And uh, uh, when it says that uh, many of the graves of those, uh, of the saints, uh, were opened, and the bodies of the saints came out after his resurrection and, and appeared in the holy city, okay? Now, one of the things I want to point out, it doesn't say how much time after that they came out. Are you following me? So... Jesus, when he, when he arose, he arose by himself. So when we look at resurrection day, do we have to consider that we are going to be uh, taken up on resurrection day? I, I don't think that we have an example of that actually taking place. But what's interesting is an unnamed amount of time is they came out of their graves after the resurrection. Well, how long after? We're not told, but we are told that it's after. And so what I'm telling you, look at this. Look at this right now. And I want you to hold on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. If it's after the resurrection, doesn't that imply that we as the bride will also be taken after the resurrection day? Hold on to that. I believe that's truly the case. And I'm hoping that you are going to be filled with joy that he is coming for us. Don't lock him into a day. Just know that he's coming and keep looking up. I love you, brothers and sisters. And do not be discouraged. I am still firmly convinced this is the timing, and let's keep looking up. Jesus is about to call up his bride. God bless you all. Maranatha, and we'll see you hopefully very soon in the clouds. Bye-bye now.